Good morning and welcome to the APG Magnetostricted Probe webinar. My name is Brian Ritchie and I'm joined today with Carl Reed as we discuss the Magnetostricted Probes. First of all, I'll ask for two things. Number one is uh, save your questions for the end. We'd be happy to review them. And number two, please mute your microphone. And uh, today we'll be covering um, how these Magnetostricted Probes work, some of the application suitability guidelines, and then we'll also take a look into the uh, APG Magnetostricted Probe product line in more depth, and then talk about some real world field applications. So Carl, can you help us start with some of these, um, with how these float sensors work? Um, we, have, and we have a diagram here kind of showing the principle of the magnetostrictive technology that we use in these probes. Um, the probe consists of a stem that has a magnetostrictive wire that runs the length of the, of the stem and a float that slides up and down on the stem and inside of the float is a, a magnet. Um, we excite the magnetostrictive wire with a current pulse and that current pulse develops a, a magnetic field that travels down the, the magnetic or the magnetostrictive wire. When that the produced magnetic field interacts with the magnetic field from the float, it will produce a strain pulse that's reflected back to the pickup at the top of the probe. And the time, of, the time of flight from the time that we transmit until we receive back that reflected pulse is the time, the time we can calculate the position of the float on the stem with great accuracy um, on that one. And that'll, that'll give us a, a, a distance or position of the float. Uh, we'll measure many times on that one to be able to get, I'm uh, sure we get a good, a good accurate measurement um, so as you're, as you're using these probes, uh, one of the things that you don't have to worry about, of course, is beam angle with this because uh, the measurement is all contained within the stem. You do have to make sure that the float doesn't, uh, can move freely on the stem. Um, the probe's not affected by vapors, so there's no problem with that one. With that, the magnetostrictive probes work in just about any liquid. Um, uh, even the very viscosity, very, very high viscosities. Um, they're easy to set up, um, have excellent accuracy uh, with, and they'll work with just about any chemical or fuel that you can use on these. As you're trying, as you're looking at specifying what model you need or what you need to do, some things to consider. Um, it's of course ideal if you have a tank or a tank drawing or a drawing of the tank so you know exactly what the length of the uh, probe should be. It's typically you want the probe to, be, to go all the way to the bottom of the tank. Um, so the stem, stem lake needs to be built according to that one. We, it, it's important to, to find the, the chemical or the liquid that's going to be in the tank so that we can make sure that it's compatible with the stem. Um, and the specific gravity of that liquid needs to be considered so that we can tune the, the probe or the float so that they will float in that, uh, in that chemical. Um, the process connection on the top of the tank or how are we gonna mount the sensor or fix it to the top of the tank? And there's one of those other things that's helpful if you have the tank drawing. Um, and then what type of output or electrical connection do you need? Now, these probes offer a, a RS, 45 uh, Modbus RTU output or four to 20 milliamp outputs. And then is the, is the area hazardous? So we can just look at that one and see if the area is hazardous. One of the advantages that we have with the, with the magnetostrictive wire is we have the ability to be able to see multiple floats on the same uh, wire. So from the same current pulse, we can get reflection from two floats. And so we, uh, can do measurements like the oil water interface, um, which is the most common, usually oil and water mixture coming into a tank and then separating in the tank and be able to measure the, the level of the water and the level of the oil or, or the top level of the tank. Uh, the oil would be the, the water minus the top level 
and then usually there's an emulsion layer that lots of times gives a lot, a lot of other technologies problems. But because of we're working with the floats, uh, there's really no problem with that emulsion layer. We have very good uh, response from, from that. And we typically just tune, tune the floats so that the top float is a, a 0.65 specific gravity. The bottom floats around 0.95 specific gravity. So we get good separation. Um, some other considerations to look at is how are we going to mount this, this probe. Uh, be mindful of, that you have enough room at the top of the tank to be able to, to get the probe in. If you don't have enough room, then we may need to consider a flex probe or something that will, will go, go into the probe or the tank easier. They need it to be mounted perpendicular to the, um, excuse me, perpendicular to the to the level and we can, if you can use a stilling well if it's needed if that's something that needs to happen um, just need to keep in mind uh, that inside of the stilling well or the tube that will we need to make sure the floats will work move, move smoothly with that one um, and then also consider keeping the the mounting of this, the sensor away from the discharge ports or the fill streams that go in there can, can affect the movement of the floats. Um, avoid agitators on, on that one. And the floats, we, we do a, a much larger ID on our floats than most, most uh, of our competitors. So we have good, uh, we don't have a lot of problem with buildup. Uh, on these and avoids the flows from sticking and, and also allows them to work in higher viscosity fluids. Um, some of the things to consider as you, you go through this one, we usually send, we'll send a descriptive drawing uh, that'll show how the flow is constructed before, before we build it. Um, there's a couple of uh, dead bands that you need to be aware of on that one. We define them as S1 and S2. The S1 dead band is a little bit due to the uh, transmit pulse on that one and how, fa how soon we can be able to detect a, a signal coming back. Lots of times that dead band is between six and 12 inches, the six inches being the shorter probes, 12 inches for the longer probes that dead band can be negated if it's a problem by two things that are actually shown on this drawing on that one. We can put a float stop at the top and it won't allow the float to go any higher and it can't go into the dead band or we can do an adjustable slide fitting on the, on the float that will uh, move the, the head of the float up out so the dead band's not in the tank. The S2 is really the float reference from the bottom of the stem. Um, this uh, is basically can, works out to be the height of the float plus the float stop. And so that's the dead band or how low you can measure in the tank. And then Brian, may, may Brian can explain some of the magnetostrictive probes that we have. Thanks, Carl. We have three different series. We have an explosion proof series. And then we have two newer series. One of them is uh, intrinsically safe, and the other one is API 18.2. Starting off with the exposure proof series, again, the accuracy, as Carl mentioned, is very good. It is good as 0.05% of full scale. And we have four series that we'll talk about next. And then also a titanium version that is available upon request. This series is class one, div one, the uh, flex is class one div two. Uh, keep in mind though, uh, when we talk about the IS series next, the flex version is class one div one in that respect. The rod material, the wetted part is 316L. And as Carl mentioned, you do need to know the specific gravity of the liquid because that helps to identify the type of float that we wanna use. The types of materials are 316L, buna, polyurethane, and titanium. These come in different sizes, and are also based upon the specific gravity of the liquid, and then also plays a part in chemical compatibility as well. As far as the process mounting options, you got a choice of triclover, NPT, or flange. And as far as the outputs, you've got a choice of four to 20, uh, two wire loop powered or three wire loop power. And we can also do Modbus. 
which the great thing about Modbus is you can get with a temperature output as well. And they do come with a lightning transient protection. So digging into those four models, we've got the E and the R series to start off with. On, on the left is the E series. This is a smaller, lightweight version where space is limited. The stem on this one is a half inch diameter and the range of depths is anywhere from one to 12.75 feet. On the right is the R series. This is a larger stem of one inch diameter of 316L, and it has a larger float for harsh or buildup concerns. You can see that the depths are anywhere between four to 31.75 feet. And keep in mind, uh, this picture shows this optional internal digital display, which is not hazardous rated, but the standard uh, R series is class one div one. On the left here is the flex series. And this is really nice because it uh, has a 316L stainless flexible braided stem and it coils very easily for simple installation in tall tanks. It's easy to ship, easy to install. This one is class one div two and the standard depths are 10 to 32 feet. Although we've done specials as small as 30 inches in the past. On the right there is the E, e chemical, which has a special resistant coating for use in corrosive and acidic type of applications. It's for shorter tanks of one to 12.75 feet and a five piece mineral mortar is required for this one. The next one is the newer series, which is the IS series of the magnetostrictive uh, probes. And uh, this was designed really for mobile container applications. And these are applications where they can be remote, they may not have local power, but they need hazardous ratings. So the heart of this is um, the uh, MDI uh, Modbus display and controller. This is intrinsically safe. It's battery powered with an internal intrinsically safe barrier for a class one zone one installation. So at the push of a red button on the left here, you can wake it up. And this is a part of a fully self-contained, intrinsically safe Modbus level measurement system. So we can power up our new uh, series of probes, the intr intrinsically safe magnetostrictive probes. And you can see that they have global certs for hazardous ratings, class one div one, class one zone zero for all probes. You can do a max length of 25 feet. And again, this pairs well and can be powered up with the MDI display that we talked about, or you can power it up separately. Digging into the IS probes, we've got the E and the R series again. The E is for the smaller tanks of one to 12.75 feet. And then the R is on the right. And this one is for four feet to 31.75 feet. The flagship of the IS series is the Flex. So this one is class one div one. And again, this features the 316L flexible braided stem and coils easily, ships easy, easy to install. Standard ranges are 10 to 25 feet. And some of the specialty probes that we've got as well on the left is the E for chemical. And this one has a special Kynar coating for uh, ranges of one to 12.75 feet. And then on the right is the titanium. And this is for longer tanks, 10 to 25 feet, titanium. So it's great for H2S and other types of compatible chemicals with the one inch stem. So Carl, do you want to tell us something we're working on? And we also, along with our flex stems, we also have a flex stem that we are developing that has a Kynar jacket or a Kynar stem, which has greater chemical compatibility. Um, and it's a 5 8 inch diameter. It's easy to be able to install um, with this, the same approvals of both. <coughs> physically safe or explosion proof will, will be this one for uh, for class one division one class one zone zero areas and the maximum length for this probe will be 45 feet and so we're very excited about this one keep in mind also another new product that, that we have that we've uh, developed is uh, the mpx probe with uh, api 18.2 approval for crude oil custody transfer. So this is used for the, the probes that are off the wellhead to be able to, to, to move the, the oil and, and do custody transfer for the oil. Has the same approvals that we've talked about. Um, it comes in a resistor or a stainless steel stem 
and the titanium stem. The titanium is used for the, uh, less uh, buildup on the stem. We've had great success with the titanium with less buildup. Um, they have the ability of temp digital temperature sensors and the placement is per the API 18.2 standard. Otherwise, the specifications are just like that we have talked before. Um, the next drawing here gives an idea of where the where the sensors are placed in the stem. We'll have multiple sensors according to the standard that are placed in the stem uh, for this custody transfer. Um, all of those temperature sensors are NIST traceable uh, with an accuracy of plus or minus 0.25 degrees C. And it will give an output, a temperature output with the average, average temperature readings of this of the temperature sensors that are submerged. And so we can do that calculation because it's within the sensor. And Brian, let's talk about some of the applications that we're using these in. Sure. Uh, one of them is uh, working with a company that's uh, starting with food grade ethanol and it's used to extract a, extract, uh, a proprietary food material. And they initially reached out to us for accuracy in tanks of three to six feet in depth and uh, they wanted to use ultrasonic and they were having some problems with the previous ultrasonic from another vendor and as we dug into the application we realized there were vapors so it's not suitable for ultrasonics keep in mind apg does ultrasonics very well but we'll steer you in the right direction uh, if needed and uh, after further discussion we discovered that the e-series with the sanitary fitting and the class one div one rating was ideal for what they were looking to do and presently they use the E-Series with the Modbus output. So it not only gives them a level output, but gives them a temperature output as well, because they were thinking at the time that they were going to need an external temperature sensor, which they don't need one now. Another one is a company that's working with number two fuel oil level. The customer was using an outdated wire and pulley level control that was getting tangled when they were using more than one switch point. Now they're using the E-series and the Flex series for this class one div two application for number two fuel oil level. The ranges that they use for depths are anywhere from 30 inches to 12 feet. And the output of it is being sent to their local PLC, the SCADA, or the BMS, the building management system. Another customer was working with, lead, uh, with liquid CO2. And this customer provides systems to reduce fossil fuel emissions. So their system cools, condenses, and liquefies the CO2. And uh, in the past, the customer was using a magnetostrictive level control with a lead time of over eight weeks, which was unacceptable for them. Our lead times are three weeks, which they loved. And uh, they, they use the MPX level sensor really for one of the most critical components of their system. So they put their, all of their trust in APG for this application. We've been working with a major cable and internet company for a diesel generator application for quite some time. Uh, this company is, uh, re relies on commercial power, but as we know, sometimes the power gets interrupted due to storms, et cetera. So the use of diesel generators is vital. And uh, they're using the E-Series for this hazardous um, area application for the diesel fuel level for their diesel generators all over the United States. Carl, you want to talk about? Yeah, another another application that we we do on uh, for these is for for crude oil. So we monitor crude oil condensate and produced water and in the oil fields. Uh, we work with many cover companies to monitor the the liquid level in these tanks. Um, it pre prevents spills because we're able to to report the the level of not only the oil but the, maybe the oil water interface. On that one, they can uh, schedule trucks based upon those detect detected levels. And if they use the API 18.2 version of that, they can even do the custody transfer for crude oil. Um, and these probes, uh, typically this is the MPXR, the MPXT, um, have all of the hazardous location approvals for this application. Uh, one other application uh, that's kind of but kind of specialized is the MDI and the MPI sensor and display 
for ISO containers. And so we've done this one specifically for, for ISO containers that are shipped all over the world uh, with different chemicals in them. It allows them to be able to mount the, the sensor in the top with the display down on the side, keeps people off of the top of the tank because they can just push the button on the display and see what's in the tank as it's in, as they're, they're shipping this around. Um, mounting is easy uh, for these and also wiring is easy because of the intrinsically safe system on that one. They can use con conventional wire methods, even connectors to, to be able to do this one and still meet the hazardous approvals that are needed. Uh, we also use the same system for measurement in tanker trailers, trucks, uh, to, and it allows them to be able to keep people off the top of the tank. They don't have to get up on top and stick the tank to see how much is in there on the different job sites. Um, and so it keeps, keeps people safe. Again, has the same approvals throughout the, for different international places as well as North America. And it's easy to install, it's very straightforward. One other application that, that we do is uh, large cylindrical tanks um, that are for fuel. A lot, a lot of times these are diesel tanks. Um, the sensors are mounted uh, in, in these tall tanks off, in this case, as we show here off of the rail, uh, rail terminals um, or fueling stations on that, on these, which allows us, and a lot of times these are diesel tanks that are used in, we use the MPX Flex probe. Um, they're easy to install on the top of the tank, give high accuracy, reliable readings. Um, and it's it's safer because it keeps people people on the ground and they, they know what their inventory is and it works through the hazardous, the hot and cold hazardous areas on this, for this application and carries those same approvals. The same thing we do a lot in fracking, frac tanks um, throughout the oil fields to be able to monitor the let different uh, chemicals that are in these frac tanks. Um, it helps keep people off the top of the tank from being able to see what, what's inside, keeps the tanks closed uh, to, to reduce emissions, um, and they carry the hazardous, hazardous approvals for these situations or these, this application. So this concludes our magnetostrictive level webinar. And um, obviously we do a lot more than just magnetostrictive probes where we invite you to take a look at our website at apgsensors.com. So for example, you can click on the support button and you see the data sheets, the installation guides and other pertin pertinent technical information. Take a look at it. As far as uh, some contact information, first of all, we've got Carl's contact information on top, Carl Reed. Below that is mine, Brian Ritchie. And below mine is Shaw Merrill, our inside sales manager. We look forward to hearing from you and discussing whatever application you may be working on. So uh, thanks for joining. Do you have any questions? Hello, Brian. Hi there. Yeah, good morning. This is Ajay from India. Yes. Yeah. Actually, uh, I have a doubt. Uh, whenever the magnetostrictive is, uh, you know, emitting the magnetic wave, uh, like a guided wave radar, there is a, a limitation of, a, you know, the diameter of the ring. It should not come in close or in a proximity of any metal. So the same thing is applying to magnetostrictive also. It is, it is not one to consider it. What we have to be considered with with the magnetostrictive is is that you don't come uh, close enough that the flow is stopped, or as long as the flow is free to move on that one, it's not going to be a consideration that it comes in in contact with, or close to the metal. It just can't the flow can't, can't come in contact with the metal. Okay, yeah. So mostly we are installing it for the non-metallic tank like SS or uh, you know the non-metallic like PP or this one. So there is no issue for that. But uh, I just have a doubt about the, suppose the agitators or something is uh, baffles up there, which are metallic. And if it comes in close uh, to the magnetic field, does it affect anything on the accuracy part? Um, 
It does, the, the agitation, of course, doesn't affect the accuracy of this answer, but it, the, the, the agitation will, will affect the reading because the float's moving up and down. Lots of times that's where people will, uh, of course, there's dampening that's built into the sensor, into the software in the sensor. So we can do averaging and average a lot of that out. So you get an average reading. Um, you can also implement mechanical methods of doing that one, which would be a stilling well on the, on the inside of the tank or can be mounted on the outside of the tank um, to, to allow the, the movement of that one. And you get a dampening of the of signal and a, and a higher accuracy of, for the reading. Fine, fine. Thanks. And uh, one more doubt, uh, can we supply this thing for the milk application? Because there are lots of application for a custody transfer for raw milk, but because there are billing for the farmers uh, based on the, uh, the custody transfer. So it's require a very much accurate instrument. So will it be okay for the milk custody transfer? We do not. We do. We do not have any custody transfer um, approvals uh, on these. So we have very good accuracy, but we've never, never achieved the custody transfer approvals for, for this for this probes. So for food industry, I mean, we cannot recommend like food industry. I mean, it uh, requires some FDA approval or something. Yeah, and it, it, it milk. And that application would also require 3A approval, at least in the United States, requires 3A approval. On, and we do not have, we do have a, a for, for smaller tanks, we do have a resistive chain probe that we use with, that has 3A approvals, but we do not have any of the magnetostrictive probes that have 3A approvals. But if you can get with us later, we can get some information on, the, on our, our resistive chain probe that has the 3A approvals. And uh, one more, uh, this one. Uh... Yeah. That's it. Okay, yeah, that's it. actually, uh, okay. in, uh, in your presentation, you said that uh, for some, uh, you know, the deposition happens uh, because you are putting some space big enough for the movement. So for what kind of such an application where the deposition may happen on the probe, it will work. Uh, what kind of applications you see? I mean, for the deposition, the material gets deposited. I didn't get that. Can, can you say that again? I didn't quite catch that. Yeah, yeah. I'll repeat. Uh, sure. In the presentation, in the presentation, you mentioned that there is a enough space for the movement of float. Oh. So so internal dia is a big one. So if the deposition happens over the probe, it may work. But what kind of applications you recommend for this? The sticky material or the this one like? I'm not sure that, uh, but we we do have uh, because our our probes and the, the way that we started with this one is actually in the probes we were building these started uh, monitoring with mud tanks. So we are the, the beginning or the first probes that we did of this way was, was for drilling mud. And with that one, we developed a probe that had a, a wider ID on the float to allow more movement and allow the flood, the, the, the mud to be able to go through there and not, not affect the movement of the float on the stem. Uh, we've kept with that in our magnetostrictive probes. And so we have a, a wider ID on the float that allows the movement on, on of the probe. So, it, so some buildup on the stem really doesn't have any effect on the movement of the float up and down the stem. And so a, a lot of times when, when uh, our competitors are having problems with buildup and hanging on to that one, it's because they have such a tight tolerance. We have a lot more room there. It also allows us to be able to work with higher viscosity liquids um, that uh, allow the material to move up and down on that one and not hold the float down. I hope that uh, What will the max temperature we can of, uh, allow for this maximum temperature for the device? A 85 degrees C for 185 degrees F. Thanks, Carl. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay. 
Thanks for joining. This concludes the presentation. Thank you very much. Have a great day.